you're spending time on the ground uh, as a mayor. Uh, in fact, if we could get the U.S. Congress to behave a little more like the U.S. Conference of Mayors, led, by the way, by, uh, by Mayor Steve Benjamin of, uh, of Columbia, this country would be a better place. Needless to say, a lot of people were also uh, a little bit surprised by uh, the age of the candidate in this campaign. Uh, but we're finding that that, too, has helped us to open the door to a generational alliance of people of every age who care about the future, who are focused on what America is going to look like in the years ahead. And part of what I'm trying to do is offer a picture of policies that are going to make us better in 2030, 2040, 2050, and beyond, which means by definition it can't be something that revolves around the personality of the current president. Uh, because if, if we're only able to talk about him, then we're not going to be talking about voters and how the decisions we make are going to affect the issues that voters most care about, whether it is climate, whether it is economic security, whether it is racial equity, uh, any of the things that actually decide how our lives are going to go that depends so much on what happens in Washington, but that are not being addressed partly because we're all mesmerized by this horror show that we see every time we turn on cable news. And so we have got to move past the show. We've got to change the channel from that show that's going on, and that's what this campaign is about. Uh, our message of freedom, democracy, and security is intended to take words that everybody says they're for, that nobody can be against, and explain what they mean on the ground in practice. Uh, and I believe that uh, each of these themes points in a specifically progressive direction when you take them seriously. That freedom, for example, uh, though it has been monopolized in political language by our friends on the right, uh, freedom is actually what's at stake in progressive policies because we're trying to establish the conditions that make you free to live a life of your choosing uh, and that you don't enjoy that freedom if you don't have health care. And so you are not free to start a small business because you can't afford to leave your old job. That you are not free if you're a teacher, prevented from being able to practice your craft in the classroom. And I'm so proud to see the teachers of South Carolina standing up. Uh, and I'm thankful for that. <laughs> that the freedoms, the economic freedoms that organized labor has struggled to bring us are now in retreat and that you don't enjoy freedom if you're not free to organize uh, for better working conditions uh, and better pay, whether it's teachers uh, or any other uh, organized union uh, or people who ought to be organized into a union in order to help build up the middle class again in this country. Uh, we are the ones who are defending the kinds of freedoms that cannot come about unless we have the right kind of government, not just big or small, um, but the right kind of government in Washington. We're talking a lot about security because I think security has been uh, narrowed in our vision into something that can only uh, be dealt with with things like putting up a wall. Where I, th I think the 21st century security threats that are really going to decide whether we can succeed are uh, very much not the kinds of things that you can deal with by putting up a wall from sea to shining sea. And they're not just the kinds of issues that I worked on when I was in uniform. Uh, that real security in its richest sense means taking a longer view and recognizing that climate, for example, is a security issue, that our lives depend on dealing with climate disruption and climate change at a time when more and more extreme and frequent weather events are happening to us. So let's talk about that for the security issue it is. Let's talk about cybersecurity. Uh, that will be a major issue for the rest, uh, certainly, of my lifetime and is only growing in importance. Let's talk about the lack of security that you experience if Washington continues to fail to deliver common sense gun reform in this country. Let's talk about the security that people of color sometimes do not feel in encounters with police officers when you have a veil of mistrust uh, between, in particular, black residents and the officers sworn to keep them safe. Let's talk about why that's a security issue, too. And yes, let's talk about uh, the security issues at stake in the rising tide of violent white nationalism that is claiming lives in this country and around the world. Now, in order to deal with any of these issues I think are important, from education to climate, I, I believe we've got to have uh, a, a true advance in the democracy in this country. And I'm afraid the democracy is actually in retreat. We like to hold ourselves up as a democracy, but we're getting less democratic as we go. 
partly because of voter suppression, because there are some in politics who seem to believe that they would be well served if fewer people vote. To me, that's an indication there's just something wrong with your policies, if you need fewer people to vote in order to win. Um, but what we need to do is to validate and defend the right of every eligible citizen to vote. Uh, and when you see voter ID laws, uh, when you see the, uh, the obstacles put up to voter registration, when you see the refusal to make uh, Election Day a holiday, uh, you're seeing an agenda to make it harder to vote. But that's just the beginning of it. We know that money in politics is making us less democratic. We know that districts being drawn so that politicians are choosing their voters it makes us less democratic. By the way, for my dime, as a fellow uh, deep red state resident uh, with progressive values, I would suggest that we'd be better served as a democracy if the way we picked our president was simply to count up all the votes and give it to the person who won. But above all, I think we need to make sure that we are talking about politics in terms of everyday life, in terms of the way that our lives go differently when there's good policy versus bad policy. Uh, and it's true on things like health care. Uh, it's why the ACA went from being uh, a toxic issue for Democrats in 2010 to the winning issue for Democrats in 2018. It, we can clap for that. It's true when it comes to uh, health care more broadly. It's, it's how my family's life was changed because Medicare exists. Uh, that as we were struggling through health issues affecting my parents, that we knew we wouldn't be bankrupted by those issues. Um, it's the everyday impact of uh, anyone's life in the military who is ordered abroad on the, on the orders of a president. It happened to me. Um, every issue in politics is personal for someone. I say this as somebody whose marriage depends on the grace of a single vote in the U.S. Supreme Court. None of this is theoretical. So we need to present our agenda in a way that reminds everybody that it's personal for everyone for different reasons. But everyone has a personal stake in what's going on. Uh, let me just close by uh, and, and get into more of a, a conversation, but I just want to close by mentioning that we are now in the phase of growing our organization and deepening it and above all broadening it. So uh, I can officially report that we have outlived the flavor of the month period because it's been more like two months since uh, we went national. Um, but I'm also conscious that uh, we've got a lot of work to do uh, to make sure that we are assembling a coalition that reflects the breadth and the diversity of our party of my generation uh, and increasingly of this country. And we need help reaching out uh, both to get our message in front of more voters because I believe when people hear our message they like it, but also to make sure we shape the conduct of this campaign to make it as inclusive, to, to show rather than tell what kind of administration I will run. Uh, not only by pointing to the administration that I've put together in South Bend in my two terms as mayor, but also through a campaign that needs to live out those same values. And that conversation can be challenging, but that's exactly why we need to have it. And I'm thankful for your attention today. I'm very eager to jump into a dialogue today, uh, and I'm very eager in particular to follow up on today's conversation uh, to keep building those relationships that are going to help make this the kind of inclusive, uh, growing campaign uh, that will not only win but deserve to win. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop talking, and, uh, and I'll be eager uh, to talk about whatever you think is of interest until somebody tells me we're out of time. Yes, sir? Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Surprise. Surprise. I'm Desiree, and I am an um, ACLU Rights for All voter. Um, you've encountered us before. Uh, my question is, will you commit to restoring the right to vote to all Americans, including those currently incarcerated? So my focus right now is on restoring voting rights for those who are formerly incarcerated, which we don't yet have in many parts in this country. Uh, I'm also mindful of the history of felon disenfranchisement in this country and that it is tied in with patterns of exclusion and injustice that have been perpetrated throughout our justice system. And it's why the issue is not only what happens for people who are incarcerated, um, but uh, uh, why people are incarcerated and whether they're going to stay incarcerated. So as we move, for example, to legalizing marijuana, is that going to be retroactive? 
Are we going to be expunging records for people who were incarcerated in ways where the incarceration did more harm than the original offense? Uh, I believe we should. I believe we should look at sentencing disparities between uh, different kinds of drug abuse. We took a first step on this as a country, uh, looking at the crack cocaine sentencing disparity. There's still a lot of issues here. As we work, for example, in Indiana to deal with the opioid epidemic, where I think Americans are finally realizing that addiction is a medical issue, not a moral issue. A lot of people, in, uh, especially in the black community in South Bend, have been coming up to me and saying, you know, Mayor, that, that's great that everybody's real enlightened now about opioids. Where were you during the crack, crack epidemic, right? Um, and, uh, I mean, personally, I was about 10 during that, during that issue. But, um, but we, we've got a lot to answer for. Uh, and the next president's going to have a lot to work to do. Uh, now, I know that uh, some people would like to see that extended to people who are currently incarcerated too on voting. I haven't been able to get that far. Um, but I will say that we've got a lot of work to do on issues where I think we can bring Americans together for reform. And as we reform, we need to continue to make sure that this is a more just and more equal country every step of the way. Yes, right in the middle. Yes. Hi, Mayor Pete. Thank you for coming to our communities and being interested in what we have to say. My name is Teal, and my question uh, is concerned with mental health. Yes. And uh, this is a concern very near and dear to me. Um, you talk a lot about security and what's important to us and our communities. For me, um, I don't feel secure to be open with my employer about my mental disability for fear that like I would be fired, which I have actually been recently. Um, and I don't feel secure to utilize my therapist to the fullest extent because I could be denied coverage for all of my appointments, which I actually have been in the past. And I don't expect to consider these issues when you're building policy. And you. if you have any ideas, um, that would be great. Thank great. you. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks so much for raising that. I, I see that isn't an easy thing for you to stand up in a room with cameras and, and a lot of strangers and, and talk about. And uh, you're right that it's incredibly important. And by the way, while you may sometimes be made to feel like you're the only person uh, in, in a room or, or in a workplace or in a neighborhood uh, struggling with a mental health issue or disability. The reality is that's something like one in five or one in four Americans uh, who are going to have some kind of challenge on that front during their lifetimes. So every family, every workplace, literally dozens of people in this room with you, whether they're prepared to mention it right now or not, are in the same boat. So, of course, there are some things that I think we can do on the policy front, uh, including uh, insisting on mental health parity so that whenever there is, is coverage, whether it's government-sponsored or simply regulated, uh, that mental health uh, issues are treated on a par and funded on a par with, uh, with physical health challenges, uh, and that that needs to be part of the uh, research agenda for CDC and NIH, as well as the way that, that we handle uh, things like insurance coverage uh, and Medicaid. Uh, and Medicare. But in addition to the policy implications, I think that the deeper thing is, is the cultural side. And that's where uh, someone like you having the courage to stand up and raise this issue and, and share why it's personal. It's kind of what I was getting at earlier when I said how all of us has maybe a different reason why this election is personal. And you've shared yours. You're also, you're, you're breaking the silence and you're, you're chipping away at the stigma that in some way you don't even know will probably make it easier for somebody else. And so I, I promise to be a candidate and a president who will support you and, and people in a similar boat. And I just thank you for, for raising that today. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Hi, Mayor Pete. My name is Brooke Naidu, and um, I'm from Aiken, South Carolina. Obviously, I'm a teacher. Um, woo! Go teachers! <laughs> Um, but my question um, to you today doesn't have to do with education. Um, again, going back, was personal to Teal. This is something that's personal to me. Mm. I have a seven-year-old daughter who is autistic. Mm. 
when we moved here from Maryland, um, she had to we had she had to stay on a waiting list for a year and a half to receive ABA services at a critical time in her development. She is now receiving ABA services, which have helped her immensely. From the la latest statistics I saw, one in 59 children in this country is being born and falling somewhere on the autism spectrum. This is going to be a crisis if it's already not a crisis. Our children with autism, and I'm sure there are people in this room mm -hmm. that have family members or friends who have children with autism. I don't know what's gonna happen to her. I'm scared to death. She's nonverbal, she can't really take care of herself. She would be considered at the very, you know, she's not high functioning mm -hmm. at all. She, if she had cancer, she would have been treated immediately. Right. This is, this is a problem. I want to know what would a, um, a Buttigieg administration be doing about to get our children help with autism. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for raising that. Um, first of all, it's parity, again, to, to what we were saying to Teal's question. Uh, when you have uh, uh, these kinds of disabilities or, or, uh, or other challenges, making sure, as you say, that, that we take it as seriously as if it were a physical health issue like cancer. Uh, we also know, I mean, as, as you hopefully have experienced, when somebody is qualified and trained to work well with someone with autism, they can do amazing things. Um, I'm married to one, so uh, uh, my husband cut his teeth doing theater education for kids with autism. Um, and he's a teacher, uh, well, I, I kind of wrecked that with the whole campaign thing, but um, uh, up until recently, he's been in the classroom, and, and uh, some of his proudest moments uh, have been moments when he's had a student with autism, and he's just been able to bring something out of them. Um, but far too few kids uh, have access to those kinds of teachers. We don't have enough of them to begin with. And so in a way, I know this wasn't the question you raised, but part of this, I think, can't be separated. Uh, from the question of whether we will honor and accordingly compensate the teaching profession and recognize that special education deserves a special place in that constellation that we ought to be holding up. So uh, we will continue to have a shortage as long as we aren't investing in training, professional development, employment, and compensation uh, for people, whether it's in the clinical side or whether it's on the teaching side. We need to do both. I believe there is widespread bipartisan support for us to do both, but that means we actually have to be prepared to put funding into it. And that's something that we uh, ought to be willing to summon the political will to raise revenue for, uh, because it touches so many families and it's the right thing to do. So, thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, please. <laughs> Mike's behind you. Um, There's a mic for you, too. I don't think I need it. <laughs> Um, my name is Dr. Bambi Gaddis. I work with an AIDS organization uh, here, the South Carolina HIV Council, 25 years old this July. My question has to do with incarceration of HIV positive people. Hmm. I know that Indiana, as you've already noted, had an opiate issue, and with that, there was a significant increase in HIV. Yes. Um, what was your position, and how despite our vice president's <laughs> thinking around this epidemic, um, what did you do to deal with individuals who were incarcerated for one issue, but upon being um, outed for their HIV status or getting 10 times the rates of incarceration <laughs> or having their sentences extended solely based on their health status. Mm -hmm. And so from a national level, I'm wondering what you'll be, what are your thoughts about how do we work with the criminal justice system mm -hmm. so that they get up to speed on the science right. of HIV? Right. So there's a lot there, and I may need you afterwards to educate me a little bit on the specific concern of people's uh, uh, incarceration being prolonged over HIV status, because I'm not sure I have a strong enough understanding of that, and I think you can help me understand that. What I will say is that in South Bend, uh, we've worked with uh, uh, robust organizations uh, that serve uh, people with HIV AIDS and overlap uh, with organizations that serve ex-offenders. And uh, a lot of that relies on federal funding. Uh, so if that gets cut, uh, we're going to be uh, worse able to serve people. Uh, you mentioned uh, an outbreak that happened in the other part of our, uh, on the southern uh, side of our state, um, in a place called Scott County. 
Uh, my mother's from there. Uh, and there was a, a terrible HIV outbreak, so bad that even Governor Pence was eventually compelled to declare a state of emergency and set up a needle exchange. Uh, now, even though that's a long way from where I live, I visited that needle exchange. And what I saw was extraordinary. First of all, the proportion of people in those rural communities who relied on this needle exchange was, was extraordinary. I think they had something like 600 people in a community with just a few thousand people. So you just do the math and you realize how many people are subject to some kind of injection drug addiction. Um, it wound up doubling as a Medicaid intake center because once people came through the door, they could connect them with everything they needed from access to medical care to, uh, to food aid. Uh, and so, you know, that was saving lives. And yet it is being, I think in many cases, that, that approach, things like needle exchange, uh, are being denigrated when they belong as part of our public health solution. Um, what I do know about uh, HIV AIDS uh, right now in the current administration is while uh, they've been saying some of the right things in terms of uh, uh, saying that they want to eradicate it, uh, you're seeing the reverse in the current budget request that went up, including making it harder to get access, and I assume this is the case for people incarcerated, but again, you can help educate me on, on this, making it harder to get access to things like antiretroviral medication that can help uh, stop the spread of it, which, was, which just uh, was the subject of an incredible uh, breakthrough uh, revealed in a study, say, and hep hepatitis C. Um, look, if, and this goes back to the other question about criminal justice reform, right? Um, if somebody is in a just system, which is not where we're at, but in a just system, if someone is, has their freedom suspended because they're convicted of an offense, um, that can never uh, be allowed to translate into being sentenced to disease, being sentenced in effect to torture, being sentenced to mental illness, which I believe is what happens so long as we tolerate things like prolonged solitary confinement, which should be brought to an end. Um, <laughs> rather, it is that certain rights are suspended and then they are restored. Uh, and even that is only something that our society should feel comfortable about if we know that those laws are being equitably applied, which we know today is not the case. So thank you for raising that. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. I'm Beverly Diane Frierson. You have identified security, democracy, and freedom as the cornerstones of your campaign mm. with Trump in the White House, <laughs> <laughs> specifically what do you identify as the threats to democracy and how would you rectify them? Great. So we're living in a very delicate time for democracy. You know, to be honest, I, I grew up believing incorrectly that America always made progress in the direction of being more democratic. It started out as a place where only white property owning men could vote or could be full citizens, and then it expanded. Maybe you didn't have to own property, and eventually uh, women's suffrage came along, and then eventually civil rights came along, and it felt to me, before I became better educated, it felt to me like a one-way trip, slow and, and, and frustrating, but, but always moving in the direction of democracy. Um, and then I learned a little more about things like Reconstruction and the fact that we actually had a high watermark of things like uh, uh, black representation in political office, and then things got worse. And they got worse because people made them worse. And so really it's a story of ups and downs. And I do not want to be, I don't, I don't want to belong to one of the generations that at the end of my life sees our country less democratic than at the beginning. Uh, voter ID laws are making our country less democratic. When you go to vote in South Bend, it's election day tomorrow actually, I'll be going in to vote. The first thing you see on the door of any polling place is this big poster with a big sign that says, stop. And it tells you all the terrible things that will happen to you if you, uh, if you try to vote and you don't have the right kind of ID. Or, or, uh, the, to me, as somebody who put my life on the line to help defend democracy, that's what I believed I was doing when I joined the military. Um, and as somebody who's bothered by low turnout rates, Last thing I want people to be getting the message of when they're getting ready to exercise their right is stop. So voter ID laws is one example. Uh, redistricting is an example of how democracy is under attack. Uh, and frankly, both parties have done this over the years. Uh, but right now, it is mainly benefiting the Republican Party because uh, more Democratic votes could happen to the tune of millions in the U.S. House, and we might still not 
have the House in Democratic hands because of the way the districts are drawn. And of course, there's a very ugly racial history to gerrymandering. So that's an example. The role of money in politics, which is only getting worse in this administration, is an example uh, of a policy that's making, or a set of policy failures, that's making us less democratic. It's basically saying that uh, corporations have the same political rights as human beings. And if it takes a constitutional amendment to reverse Citizens United, then that's what we ought to do. Uh, it also matters, I mean, there's, you've invited, there's so many things on the list that I don't want to talk all day, but, but um, <laughs> it also matters whether we're willing to sign up for defending democracy around the world. Not in the Bush administration style of doing it at gunpoint, uh, which is why I was particularly bothered to see this administration making noises like it might send troops to deal with the problem in Venezuela, uh, as though we learned nothing about regime change wars last decade. Um, but American moral leadership, diplomatic leadership, economic leadership in support of democracy matters. And so if our attitude toward the Saudi regime killing a journalist who is a U.S. resident is a shrug, if it doesn't bother us that a hostile foreign adversary in Russia attacked our democracy, the most precious thing we've got, um, then it's very hard to believe that we're going to be willing to protect democracy at home. And so our foreign policy needs to align our interests with our values. And we've got to be ready to stand up for democracy. Uh, the good news is uh, we've got an election on. And that is an opportunity to defend democracy, too. And I think that if people who have been conducting undemocratic behavior, whether it's any of the things I listed or others, all with the blessing of this White House, uh, see this White House resoundingly defeated in 2020, maybe it'll make them think a little more about whether they're willing to continue that sort of behavior. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, right front and center. Uh, as a fellow millennial, I have two, uh, kind of a two-part question for you. Okay. Uh, what will you do to, I guess, impact climate change? Mm. As that's one of the pressing issues for our generation. And what will you do to impact uh, the college debt crisis right. that's impacting our right. generation? So, uh, look, climate change is going to affect whether our generation gets uh, the kind of opportunities that uh, our predecessors did or not. Uh, I am always on edge this time of year because uh, this is when we get a lot of rain back home. And the frequency and severity of extreme rain has led to us having a 1,000-year flood and a 500-year flood two years apart that I had to deal with in South Bend. I was thinking of the math there. A 1,000-year event followed by a 500-year event the next year. And so we've got to act. To me, that means several specific steps. Uh, and I think that what the New Deal, the Green New Deal framework gets right is the idea that if we take all of these steps at once, it will be a national project that will help make all of us better and create economic opportunity and jobs. Uh, what does that actually mean in practice? Well, uh, we've got to massively invest in research and development on renewable energy, uh, on carbon storage, and on energy storage, battery technologies. Uh, we should probably be quadrupling our current federal funding at a minimum. Another thing we have to do is set a price on carbon. Uh, you might even go so far as to call it a tax. Uh, this is not a politically easy thing to do, but it is the right thing to do. And if we get it right, we can redistribute that to Americans. So this is not about taking money out of the economy or taking money out of your pocket. This is about making sure that the market actually reflects the harm done by uh, things that put a lot of carbon into the air. But we can immediately rebate it back out every year to Americans, and we can do it in a progressive way so that most Americans, in terms of their bank book, uh, their bank balance, will be better off because we did it. And while we're at it, it will reduce the carbon going into the atmosphere. Third thing we should do, as mayor's eye view of the world, right, is support cities in becoming more sustainable. The way that cities are built, their power grid public transportation, if we were really investing in that, uh, and not to mention public transportation between cities, fast trains. I'm not even asking for Japanese standard trains. I would be happy for Italian level trains. Um, uh, but we've got to do better than we're doing right now. So there's a whole package of things that we could be doing 
that would also help us head off climate change. And, frankly, we're going to have to start taking steps to adapt to climate change no matter what, because it's not happening in theory. It's happening to us, and it's only going to accelerate. Uh, student debt is a personal issue for us. Uh, Chaston in deciding to become a teacher um, is uh, treated by the uh, interest rates on student loans the same as if he had uh, become a lawyer or a doctor or a business person. I think it's as worthy a, a job choice as any of the others, but it doesn't pay quite the same. Uh, matter of fact, uh, while I believe in, strongly in bartenders being well paid, it bothers me a little bit that he, is, uh, he made less as a teacher after he got his master's degree, uh, which was very expensive, uh, than he did tending bar in order to put himself through school <laughs> to get the master's degree. Um, and a lot of people are in that boat or for any number of different reasons, living with uh, six-figure student debt like we do in our household. And so we've got to make it more affordable. What does that mean in practice? First of all, making it more affordable on the front end for people about to start college. It's why Pell Grants should be expanded. It's why uh, we need to press with a carrot and stick system, press states to pick up more of the tab uh, instead of foisting the cost of college onto students for in-state tuition. Uh, it's why we need to support HBCUs. Uh, we were just at uh, South Carolina State today. Um, one of many schools with an amazing track record of helping to uh, propel people into the middle class. Uh, and, and there should be support behind that. Uh, it's why if I can refinance my mortgage, there's got to be some way uh, to, uh, to refinance or adjust the interest rates when they're too high on student debt. So those are just a few of the things that I think we should do uh, because college needs to be affordable in order for us to have a healthy middle class in this country. Thanks. All right, so many folks. They're in the back on the, on the side. Yes, ma'am. A little bit more, if you would, my name is Catherine, hmm. and a little bit more, if you would, on money and politics. Yeah. Uh, we had a two-year public corruption trial, hmm. uh, grand jury trial here in South Carolina. The several indictments, we have not yet had our laws passed. I'm actually going to a, uh, a House Judiciary meeting tomorrow Great. where hopefully two dark money bills will hmm. be on there and hopefully will pass. But if you aren't able to get the constitutional amendment, what can you do to help push the states along as president yeah. to address the issue of dark money and public corruption? Well, I think the, the next best thing we can do, I, I do think probably in the long run we'll have to act constitutionally, but uh, we can't afford to wait to start acting to clean up uh, our politics. It's why I was a big fan of H.R. 1, uh, that the, a pro-democracy anti-corruption bill that was passed by the House. Now, of course, that bill's going over to the Senate, where it will be left to the tender mercies of uh, people like Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham. And uh, uh, I don't expect that it will survive the Senate, let alone get to the president's desk. But if it got to my desk, I would sign it right away. Uh, it is just the beginning, but one of the provisions in H.R. 1 is that it deals with dark money. Uh, transparency goes a long way. It's not as good as limits, but it's the next best thing, because at least you know who is spending huge sums of money to try to influence our democracy. Uh, another thing that we can do is public funding. Uh, I had the uh, uh, wonderful experience, uh, was it yesterday? God, time is crazy. Uh, the wonderful experience yesterday uh, of spending some time with President Carter. Uh, and... Um, <laughs> If you ever get the chance to go to Plains, Georgia, and watch him teach Sunday school, it is an, an amazing experience. It just makes you want to be a better person. I've also never met anybody uh, in their 90s as lucid and with it as he is. So I, I tried to ask them their, their secrets, uh, him and Mrs. Carter. They just said to eat right and exercise, which is easier said than done. But I felt newly inspired to try to do that. But he reminded me that during uh, at least one, and I think both of his elections, in the general election, they didn't have to do a lot of fundraising because the, the income tax, you check and a dollar went into the public elections fund, that was enough to run their famously shoestring campaign. Think about that. Now it's a billion dollar operation. Imagine, and by the way, I think a lot of candidates, uh, while, while we, we are, I'm very appreciative of the people who have uh, responded to the emails and come to house parties and support us, I think a lot of the candidates would enjoy living in a world where you didn't have to do a lot of fundraising. Um, so having at the federal level modeling what the states ought to do uh, it, in terms of public funding would make a lot of sense too um, because it's, it's a very small price to pay to have a cleaner democracy. But I still want to get that amendment. <laughs> yes, right in the back. Yes. First, uh, my name is Lori Volkman. I'm in Charleston and 
I promised my 12-year-old son that if I got to ask a question, I'd ask his question. Okay. But luckily, it was about college education, and that was answered. So <laughs> I'm on to my question. <laughs> but I teach at the College of Charleston, and we've had a couple of racial incidences these last, this last year. And it's 2019, and it's just it's, it's disgusting. And yeah. you mentioned white nationalism, and we're at a period in our country that is it's, it seems unprecedented, yet obviously it's been growing. And so I'd like to know, because I know you've thought about this and talked about this, how would you try to approach mending this problem and, and fixing it? Because it's yeah. not an easy and quick fix, but it's a necessary one. Yes. Um, so like many other answers I give, I can, I can give you kind of a policy answer and then a culture answer. Um, and I say that because one of the things I learned as mayor is that there's, a pol there's actually three parts to the job. There's policy, there's management, just competence in running an organization, and then there's, there's the leadership part that's really important that has to do with calling people to higher values. And I'm actually beginning to think, even though I uh, think the administration's policies have been terrible and their mismanagement has been terrible, that the absence of moral leadership, even though it's the hardest thing to define or put into numbers, is actually the biggest problem we've got. So some policy things that I think make a difference. Uh, first of all, one thing that you and I have in common, living in South Carolina or living in Indiana, is that we're among the very few states, five I believe, that don't have a hate crime law. That's got to change. And there could be federal incentives for that to change if we insisted on it. Uh, we also need to make sure that the Department of Justice is paying attention to these things. Uh, frankly, Homeland Security should be paying a lot of attention to these. They are a security threat. I learned about radicalization in the Middle East. There's a lot of radicalization going on at home, and it can be deadly. And counter-radicalization is hard. Unradicalizing somebody is hard. Um, but also, uh, the Department of Justice has done a lot of work to deal with some of the uh, most serious racial problems that exist in everything from school segregation to race and policing. When we hit some really painful and difficult issues related to race and policing in South Bend in my first year, I knew that as tough as that was to navigate, there was a White House and a DOJ that were there uh, to support us in that. And so I could send our police chief, for example, when, when we decided we wanted to do body cameras to build up trust uh, between community members and the police and provide that kind of accountability. I could send our police chief to the 21st century uh, uh, task force on policing at the White House, in the Obama White House, um, to get that kind of policy support and get advice on things like implicit bias training and civil rights. Um, the only time I've heard from the current White House Department of Justice related to policing was when they sent me a pretty threatening letter saying that if I didn't sign with criminal penalties attached, uh, that they were going to withdraw our police department grant funding unless I signed, saying that I was going to help them out with federal immigration enforcement, basically. Um, I didn't sign it. So that's the policy stuff. But there's a cultural thing that we simply have to be ready to say that hate has no home in America. And the good news is, even before winning an election, campaigns can make a difference, especially when there's like 20 of us, right? So all of us can be speaking with one voice and, and show rather than tell what it means to have a politics that does not seek advantage by pitting people against each other. Because this is a global crisis, and it's a crisis here at home. Uh, and they may be coming for one group today, but they might be coming for a different group later. So all of us should take this personally whether it's our group that is attacked today or not. And frankly, especially if the next president is going to be a president who's not a person of color, it is absolutely important that it be the best presidency ever for beating back prejudice and in particular white nationalism. <laughs> sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Johnny Cordero, and I'm the chair of the South Carolina Democratic Black Caucus. The last time we talked, yes. um, I gave you a hard time. I really did. And some of the people who were there who were present said afterward to me that I was too hard on you. So let me just say something to them publicly. 
You answered every question forthrightly and directly. I was impressed by Thank the you. depth of your knowledge. And so those of you who think I gave him too hard a time, what I did was help him show how good he really is. And thank, thank you for coming back. Thank you. So, we talked about, we talked about reparations. Yes. And we talked about mass incarceration. So yes. I'm not going to go there again, and you can go there if you like. Yes. But what I wanted to ask you is because I know you're learning as you go along, and I yes. bet you've made that very clear to us. You said that you're not, just a minute ago, that you're not quite there with regard, regard to prisoners voting or people mm -hmm. in jail or in prison voting. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to offer you a few, minutes, a few, question, a few uh, insights for you that might help you to get there. Okay. okay. First of all, citizenship, the United States Supreme Court says, cannot be taken away mm -hmm. under any circumstances. One of the fundamental rights of citizenship is the right to vote. So my question for you, and something I would ask you to think about and address if it's all right for you now, is how can you not recognize mm -hmm. that even those who are convicted felons and those who are in prison are still citizens, and that as citizens, we cannot take away their fundamental right to vote? Take away their fundamental right to vote. And finally, that while they're in prison, millions of people are there now while they're in prison on, or on probation and parole are unable to vote. And the benefit of allowing those people to vote would be twofold. It would inure to the benefit of, all, of the entire democracy, and secondarily, it would allow those people who are in jail and who haven't been in prison, it would allow them the right to vote on those who represent them, and perhaps as importantly, to change the laws. If you could consider that, would that change your mind? Um, first of all, I respect the Thank philosophy you. behind your question. And by the way, I also appreciated the uh, 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 the challenges that you gave me the last time we spoke. So I, I took it in the spirit it was intended. And I, I appreciate it. Um, at risk of answering your question with a question, I, I guess one thing I would one thing I would be trying to reason through is how do we decide which rights are suspended and which are not when somebody is incarcerated? Uh, because we clearly decide some of them are some freedoms that, that we all value. Uh, and again, it would be easier for any of for us to swallow any of this if we thought that the criminal justice system was actually fair. And there are a whole bunch of challenges with that. Um, there should not be the mass numbers of people incarcerated uh, that there are, as you mentioned. And one thing, just because I didn't mention it earlier, and, and uh, so I appreciate the opportunity of the topic coming up again, is that if we really want to see that reduced, we also need to change a system where people have a financial interest in more people being incarcerated, which is why we need to end private prisons. Yes. I guess the question I would, I would struggle with and I would want to reason through with you, and maybe we can't do it out loud now, but, but maybe we can keep in touch, is, is there a way, if we're going to go down that road, and again, to me, the first order of business is when it comes to restoration of rights is that when somebody uh, has paid their debt, has, has emerged, that uh, without question, without uh, bureaucracy, uh, and certainly without monetary uh, penalties, which amount to a poll tax if you've already been released, that we restore your rights. But if we're talking about folks who are incarcerated currently, I guess the question that I would, I would have to get my head around is, um, how do we have an answer for that that is also uh, a, a sensible answer to the question that I know will be thrown back at, at me of, um, you know, what about, for example, a, a violent white nationalist? Uh, who is serving time for murder? Um, uh, you know, should somebody like that be able to vote? And there may be answers, there may be nuances, or a different You're way to draw a line. Question, are you? Um, <laughs> I, we could, or we, maybe we could take My it offline. Is, yes, but it's, um, you can't take the right to vote away. So, in your view, philosophically, in your view, philosophically, no matter what, basically, in order to be consistent, exactly. that's what we have to say. Um, and I, I respect. I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm in the same philosophy as you oh, are, but I, but I absolutely respect the thinking behind it. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Would you speak a bit about the issue of uh, immigration and talk, if you would? Would you speak a bit about the issue of immigration and speak to solutions as, as opposed to what the current administration is doing wrong? Yes. And also, do you believe that legalizing marijuana will lead to no <coughs> people using it? Uh, so the answer to the second question is, I'm not sure. Um, but what I know is that our current policy toward marijuana has led to a level of incarceration 
that has done more harm, I think, than, uh, than the drug itself. Um, I also think it's really important that we not trivialize the fact that uh, I certainly don't recommend smoking anything. And uh, seriously, I mean, it's not good for you um, to smoke anything, uh, in my opinion. And, and so we shouldn't treat lightly the public health challenges that go with drug abuse, um, even while we're trying to decriminalize uh, a lot of things where I think the, the criminal penalty has just done more harm than the thing that we're trying to discourage as a society. Um, now, to the question of immigration, I am, I'm not only the son of someone who immigrated to this country and then became a U.S. citizen, uh, but I'm also the son of a city that was built largely by immigrants 100 years ago. Uh, and at the time, they were mostly from Eastern Europe. And now, one of the reasons our city is growing again, after decades of mostly declining population, we're proud that we're growing again just a little bit. But if you do the math, without immigration, it would be zero. It would be flatline. And our problem is we need population growth, not just job growth, but population growth. So I'm very thankful that uh, in parts of the west side of South Bend, for example, um, we once again have a lot of, uh, they're largely uh, uh, large uh, Catholic immigrant working families. They, they're just speaking Spanish now instead of Polish, like it was 100 years ago. Um, but they're helping inject new life into some neighborhoods that were emptying out for a time. Um, so in terms of policy solutions, the thing that strikes me here is that if leadership has to do with taking a divisive issue that people are divided around and developing a consensus to bring people together, what we have now is, is the very opposite of leadership, and that we're taking an issue that, surprisingly, there's actually kind of a consensus around it and dividing us. What I mean by that is the outlines of bipartisan comprehensive immigration reform are well known and they're agreed on by a majority of Americans. Most of us believe that we should have a package of reforms that includes a pathway to citizenship uh, and uh, special protections for dreamers, uh, that there ought to generally be a pathway to citizenship for the 11 million some immigrants who are here now who are undocumented, that there needs to be real investment in resources to clear all these cases that are piling up for asylum, uh, and for other applications for citizenship in the lawful immigration system, like how my dad came here. And that, uh, yes, we, we should have uh, strong border security. Most people agree that that's how you put together the deal. <laughs> Sometimes it's even happened in, in the Senate, only to die in the House, or, or vice versa. So I actually believe that, that the outlines of the solution are understood. And the tragedy of our moment is that uh, immigration is more useful to this White House as a crisis than as an achievement uh, for a problem solved. It is politically useful to have us be divided against each other in this way. But the fences that are, that wall's never going to get built. But some very real walls are being built right now. Uh, the other day we were at the, uh, a minority serving institution in Houston, University of Houston downtown. And we were meeting with the students there. Um, and I met with one very impressive young woman who was brought to this country at the age of two months. It is the only country she knows. She's as American as I am, but, but not legally. And she had an incredible story, and we had a very tearful conversation. But one of the things she shared is that she feels like she's been divided now against her own siblings who were born in this country. Um, that they're feeling tension between them because this current climate and this current administration have wedged them off against each other. And I think the real fences and walls that are being built are, are <laughs> among us and between us right now. And it's another reason why the moral leadership as well as policy leadership of a new president mm -hmm. is so urgently needed in this nation. Yes. I'm coming. Um, oh, that's so, I'm in surround. And this is going to be our last question. So sorry. <laughs> Um, just on the allowing currently incarcerated folks to vote, yeah. to offer another perspective real yeah. quick. Um, a big reason why a lot of people don't agree with this is because they don't want murderers, rapists, and things like that voting. I think we can all agree on that. What I would say is there's murderers, rapists, and people like that voting right now all around this country that aren't incarcerated. And when we live in a criminal justice system that disproportionately convicts African and Americans and people of color for the same crimes white people commit, what we see uh, this criminal justice system as and not allowing currently incarcerated folks to vote is another 
tool of institutionalized racism. And so that, that's the whole, that's what I would offer up. Um, these people are already voting. People who have done horrible things are already voting because they're not even convicted in the first place. Um, and the second thing I'll say, statistics show in states and in countries where they allow currently incarcerated folks to vote, um, that the rate of return to jail drastically lowers because we're keeping them involved with their community. And when they go back into the community, they're less likely to reoffend, which is also a safety issue as well. So that's not really a question. I just wanted to offer up another statement. Um, I know that gentleman in the in the tie has a really great question to ask you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, over there. You notice how people are supporting each other? Tell us some questions. <laughs> I'm, I'm here for it. Let's do it. Did you have like the hardest question I could possibly get right now? So it's not <laughs> thanks. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thanks, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for um, my name's John Flint. I'm an ACLU Rights for All voter. Uh, the Trump administration has put a tremendous amount of pressure on local police to ignore their traditional public safety duties, which you alluded to earlier, uh, and help carry out the Trump administration's harsh deportation agenda. Right. Will you commit to stop the use of detainers which pressure local authorities to do federal in immigration? Work? Yes. Uh, it, uh, it was incredibly chilling to see the federal government basically begin to attack local leaders. Uh, the detainer issue was more of a county thing, so that didn't hit my desk. Uh, but, uh, but what I was telling you earlier where they tried to hold our police funding hostage was, was very much on it. So by the way, uh, mayors and, and cities are, are now suing and winning uh, on that issue, which is why I didn't have to. Uh, you gotta understand, if local law enforcement is being deputized <coughs> to do federal immigration enforcement's job for them, that makes it a lot harder for them to do their job. So in, the, in our city, I'm responsible and our police department is responsible for the safety of our residents. And I use the word residents because I mean, when you call 911, we're not checking whether you're a citizen. If you are there, frankly, you don't even have to be resident. You can be passing through. The point is if you are in the city limits of South Bend, we gotta help you out. And one of the biggest issues in dealing especially with violent crime is victim and witness cooperation. Partly because of veil of mistrust between law enforcement and communities of color that we've already talked about some of the reasons for that. Um, think about how much worse that gets when there is a perception, let alone there is the perception now, when there's a reality that, uh, that our local law enforcement, whose only job ought to be to keep you safe, are also potentially a threat to you. And it's that same chilling effect, by the way, that is such a problem with this census question that they're adding, um, that threatens to erase the visibility of our community's growth, but also is one more way to build up mistrust between residents in, in our communities uh, and different parts of the federal government or local government. Um, the last thing that a police, I've gone on ride-alongs with, with police officers, and um, we were just stopping by, you know, uh, Latino families, you know, in, in neighborhoods just to say hi and try to get them to make friends with an officer. And they really think twice before talking to you at all. And I don't blame them. So I have to go to, uh, you know, Radio Sabor Latino and, and trot out my bad high school Spanish um, to, to try to reassure listeners to Spanish language radio that, that the only mission that our police officers are tasked with is to keep you safe and to address, uh, to address crime. And so the reason I, I feel strongly about making sure the federal government stops trying to deputize local law enforcement to do their job for them uh, is that uh, it's not only, I think, part of an immigration system that is, uh, that is broken and unjust, but also that it makes it harder for local law enforcement to do their actual job. Did somebody say our time was running out, or did I just make that up? Yeah. It really is? Oh. Um, <laughs> so so uh, let me end where I uh, ended my remarks, which is that um, I'm really, I'm here for this conversation that, that I hope this was a beginning of, um, that I see a room full of people who are activated, who are smart, who are energized, who are passionate about justice. Uh, who may not agree 100% of the time with me or with each other, um, but who are pulling in the same direction, and whose support I hope to earn, but just as importantly, uh, who, whoever you wind up being for, 
uh, in, in this contest, once you've sorted through the 20 of us or so, um, who I hope will be able to shape this field uh, and shape these campaigns. Because I know that the conduct of our campaign will matter in addition to its outcome. Uh, so I hope that we will be able to remain in touch. I'm looking forward soon to announcing uh, an on-the-ground team here in South Carolina that will help make that happen. Uh, and uh, I cannot wait for us to have good news to celebrate uh, in the story of the progress toward justice in this country uh, come 2020.